to Moby for having us present to you all. Um, so as mentioned, Arj and I are from New Cipher, and today we just want to talk to you about our take on data privacy and end-to-end -end encryption, uh, and specifically sort of how it relates in the context of vehicular data. And then we're going to go into a little bit about what we do at New Cipher and, and sort of how we fit in that privacy preserving uh, realm. So our, just a bit about us, our, our North Star uh, for New Cipher is, is just plain and simple that you know, privacy is a fundamental human right. Um, and in our pursuit of that, uh, we basically um, focus on cryptographic infrastructure and tools for privacy preserving apps. Um, specifically for blockchain and, and decentralized apps and this sort of environment of trustlessness, uh, we provide the new Cypher network, which is basically this decentralized, uh, ac this decentralized access management system that provides um, secrets management and dynamic access, access control. So just sort of the, 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 the management of sensitive data. And so looking at the automotive industry, um, you know, we can see sort of this, this, this change that, that, that's occurring within the industry. Um, this, this idea of connected mobility, where you have these connected cars, um, cars that have you know, Wi-Fi connections, uh, they've gotten more intricate. And as a result, they start generating a lot more data uh, for analysis. You know, vehicles are connecting to each other, they're connecting to infrastructure, traffic lights, um, and, and, and this sort of interlinking of drivers, passengers, environment, uh, online services, it, it has sort of made uh, the car more of a computer on wheels than sort of the traditional view of what uh, cars used to be. Um, and a lot of this analysis and a lot of this generation of data is to further this kind of concept of self-enabled vehicles. So um, many people sort of just think about um, autonomous driving, uh, but it's, 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 uh, it's more nuanced than just that. It's things like self-configuring, so the ability for personalization um, within, or personalization of the driver or the car within an environment. Things like self-healing, so you start thinking about prognostics for um, car service. Um, things like uh, self-integration, so this sort of seamless integration between the car and the digital services around it, whether it's gas station service centers, um, as I mentioned, traffic lights, and just general um, city infrastructure. And and so not, but not only are those services becoming more prevalent or more in demand, but you also have this sort of changing model of ownership of, of, of a car. Uh, and so you have these like subscription models where people don't really, you own a car for some like period of time, or you pay the subscription fee to own a car for some period of time. Um, things like fractional ownership, so like a timeshare type service, um, car sharing, uh, and even like ride sharing. So you think of these like one-time rides, uh, whether it's carpooling or private rides um, and, and sort of what that generation of data actually means and who is it uh, attributed to given this sort of change in, in, in ownership. And so the, but the benefits of what's going on in the industry is very clear, right? Like you have all of these really interesting things that could be done uh, with this data. You know, driving is made uh, safer, more convenient, more efficient, um, better for the environment. Um, you have cities that are able to uh, improve their planning capabilities uh, based on you know, traffic patterns, et cetera. Even for OEMs, for the manufacturing of cars, you sort of have this interesting feedback loop of the car sort of potentially self-reporting on itself, and then OEMs can understand uh, wear and tear on particular parts, um, you know, over, over time and, and, and sort of better understand how their car is being used so that they can improve their process. And there's no question that there are, there is demand for this. It doesn't matter which market you're in, whether in your growth market or a mature market across the globe, 
uh, based on this IBM survey that was recently done, um, you know, consumers and customers of cars are, are sort of expecting um, car companies to deliver on some of these um, some of these technologies, and it's going to influence some of their purchase decisions. Um, and all of this is just to say that this concept in the of the auto industry, if you if you if you look at the the, the changes, essentially you're looking at some sort of a transition to more of what looks like a technology company versus what a traditional sort of antiquated um, automotive industry or automotive company uh, looks like. Cool, I'm gonna... Can everybody hear me? I think so. Okay. Yeah, I can hear you, George. Awesome. Yeah, so uh, thanks, Derek. Uh, I guess somewhat unsurprisingly, we consider vehicle owner privacy to be one of the major headwinds to the adoption and success of connected vehicles, um, not only from a regulatory standpoint, which is often cited, um, but also the risks of citizen society backlash and also just the market forces, consumer rejection of future models that go too far in their data collection and or privacy violations. So taking this like somewhat old estimate of um, 25 gigs per hour of data generated by a modern connected vehicle, um, obviously autonomous vehicles, it's way more. The important point, I guess, from a privacy point of view is that a significant chunk of this is personally identifiable, identifiable information or PII, or it can be turned into PII later by cross-referencing it with other sources. Um, that chunk of data comes with a whole bevy of issues, risks, costs, headaches that relate to privacy. So again, obvious ones like regulation, fair information practices, obviously they have to be adhered to. These could vary state to state. It's quite difficult to craft policies that account for this. Um, there's internal compliance. So you don't want any government spies in your organization like Twitter did. They had a um, Saudi Arabian spy who was supplying information on dissidents um, uh, to, the, to the government. Um, like their phone number, or for example, Google, the Google creep is a infamous story of a Google employee who used his, uh, his uh, sort of elite status as a senior engineer to spy on minors. You have, again, famous endpoint breaches, Equifax, Capital One, Marriott, Uber, they all know about the reputational and fine based cost of this. Um, you also need to, in certain jurisdictions, have a portal for users to demand their data or to delete their data. This is, again, not super straightforward. Um, data that's been de-identified or anonymized or aggregated, um, as I mentioned, can be re-identified and associated with specific people um, using data generated by other devices like their mobile. So that has to be thought about as well. Um, there's the host of liabilities. Um, the uh, channels through which people can bring suit um, through regulations like CCPA, uh, and also the liability associated with third parties if they're involved in analyzing the data, consuming the data, um, or they're buying the data from, uh, from the, uh, the data custodian. Another one that I think, again, is not thought about that much is like the move towards transparency that we're seeing in big tech. So if you go to um, Facebook, Google, Microsoft, will have dedicated portals for um, telling their users about, for example, all the law enforcement requests that they've um, had, to, had to respond to. Um, some people recommend that there needs to be like this sort of engaging, transparent dashboard, which tells the, uh, the user, or in this case, the driver, um, all, the, all the different um, uses of their data. Again, this is not um, that easy to, to do and can also um, uh, sort of backfire depending on how it's, how it's conveyed. Um, then of course, obvious stuff, privacy policies, terms and conditions could have vulnerabilities. And uh, this sort of opt out approach where we use your data until you opt out, again, it's, uh, it's fraught with vulnerabilities to, to, um, to uh, complaints and backlash and, uh, and liability. So I guess I'm portraying this kind of as like a millstone around the necks 
of automakers so or whoever is um whoever ends up being the data custodian for connected vehicle data and it is kind of it is i think the uh the um the downsides are probably not not uh explored enough but the main point of our talk is not is not just to say how terrible it is to be a data custodian and to handle vehicle owner data or driver data it's more that vehicle owner privacy could actually be a major differentiator for the first um, manufacturers and stakeholders that take this problem very seriously and apply some of the solutions that we're going to talk about. So on the point of um, data privacy, of course, the corresponding um, concept is the sensitivity of the data. And obviously, we're very aware that this is a, this is a subjective, um, subjective concept. But we can make some qualitative arguments about the data that is collected in cars and its, uh, its sensitivity by using like the comparison of uh, some of the scandals that have happened previously um, and kind of comparing the, the, uh, the nature of the data that's involved between like a scandal that's happened already and like a potential future scandal. So taking the really obvious one that everyone knows about, um, I worked on quite a lot like the uh, Cambridge Analytica scandal and how it was used uh, to manipulate people's political views. And whilst that was, that was very scandalous, I think it's important to emphasize that the actual data, the actual data that was the subject of a privacy intrusion and, and violated some of Facebook's policies uh, was basically uh, your, your likes on Facebook. So you've liked some bands and you like McDonald's, whatever, uh, your friends likes, and then your answers to a personality quiz. So relatively benign data um, if we compare that to um, some of these very broad categories that um, you know, may, may form part of the uh, connected vehicle data set uh, smorgasbord, um, you can see that it's not that hard to see. It's not that hard to see how this could be intrusive or come up with dystopian scenarios for each one of these. So you know, whether it's like how aggressively you're driving, raising your insurance pre premiums or being used against you, how many people there are in the car with you at different times of day, um, which is also a privacy violation for them. Where you go, how long you spend parked outside this bar before you drive again, where you decide to drive on holiday, who you're calling while you're in the car, um, messages you receive, um, getting to more advanced um, devices. So uh, the cameras and LIDAR, cameras and LIDAR like collect, continuously collect imagery of your surroundings, which might include you, your house, whatever. Um, biometrics, so basically like, face ID, but for starting your car, that opens up another surface for exploitation. Um, we all heard about face mash. So I won't harp on too long about how sensitive all this data is, but I think to underline this point, the point that uh, the vehicles are um, perhaps generators of more sensitive data than, than the digital platforms that we're used to, um, I've got a lot of stats about Americans and their relationship to, to this problem, but one that's uh, not on this slide, but is very interesting is that uh, average American spends 18 days a year in their car and 64% of them consider their car to be like a friend. So uh, the, the sort of conjecture here is that misusing the data generated by a vehicle, I think has the potential to taint the relationship between people and their cars and even like sort of overhaul this deeply embedded culture, which I think is a particularly American culture. Um, and yeah, the, the data on the screen, the polling data sort of aligns with this conjecture because um, if we look at just like the general uh, reaction to data collection, you know, four out of five Americans think that corporate data collection or company data collection, uh, the risks outweigh the benefits. And I just want to really emphasize this relates to corporate surveillance. Um, there's a separate question about government surveillance and the uh, percentage of consumers that say the risks outweigh the benefits there is lower. It's only 66%, which is kind of remarkable after Snowden and, and, and NSA and stuff like that. Um, so people are more concerned about companies collecting data on them. Um, another thing I should mention about this first statistic here, the 81% one, is that this particular poll by Pew was talking a lot about um, uh, digital privacy, social media, online advertising. Um, and it's important to remember that most of the services and platforms that are associated with that are used for free and they're used fairly casually. It's not that big a deal to quit your Facebook. So it's 
not a $35,000 purchase that they spend three weeks in a year. So again, trying to draw a kind of comparison between uh, platform-based privacy and vehicle-based privacy with the point being that the vehicle may be a lot worse. Just looking at the other two, um, these are zooming into sort of automotive and car-based surveys. So I think uh, last, year, last August, Ipsos did a poll that found 88% of consumers think that the vehicle owner should decide who has access to the driver and vehicle data. But it's like pretty much everybody thinks that they should control the data their vehicle generates. I think this is really important not to ignore this. Um, and then another one just to supplement this uh, IBM poll or IBV poll, I think, 62% uh, said they would choose one car brand over another based on security and privacy. Um, didn't distinguish between the two. Okay, so let's jump into what we think part of the solution can be. End-to-end -end encryption um, has become a fairly broadly recognized term. So I can assume that the audience understands the basic gist of it. Um, the main point is that if a, da a data payload can only be decrypted on the device belonging to the designated recipient and no one in between, you know, transmission, conduits, uh, servers, uh, custodians can, uh, can read it or sell it or exploit it. I think um, at its core, end-to-end -end encryption, like, like a lot of uh, cryptography, it relies on maths and cryptographic proofs that the data is not vulnerable, in this case, while it's in transit or while it's being uh, routed. So this slide is just serving to illustrate that the maths underpinning a common encryption algorithm are not that complicated. I mean, this isn't the whole protocol, but it, it kind of gets the, the main part of how a, a sender um, generates a cipher and then why it's so difficult to generate uh, to break that cipher. I just want to um, emphasize on the end-to-end -end encryption side that the what this implies when you leverage an end-to-end uh, end encrypted service like WhatsApp or, or iMessage, or there's plenty more, we'll actually talk about this, um, is that it implies very little trust in the server that's handling the message or the raw data contents. Um, and that's what sets it apart from other privacy st strategies. So like the equivalent of this would be a set of privacy policies and promises um, by the data custodian that they're not going to look at your data or not going to use it in some untoward way. And so you're basically hoping they're not going to renege on that promise or find a workaround or the disincentive, disincentive of legal repercussions or like a PR scandal are not are, are strong enough that they, they won't be tempted to do this. I think that when you compare like end-to-end -end encryption, which is just cryptography and like this hazy world of promises and privacy policies, it's, it's easy to see which one is like why end-to-end why -end encryption has like appeal, not only from the point of view of being safer, but also from the point of view of a layperson understanding the consequences of sharing their data. So they might not understand the maths behind end-to-end -end encryption, but they can understand, okay, no one is going to see this data until it gets to the recipient. Whereas when they read like they, asking them to sort of think through a privacy policy and understand all the situations that might, where they might, uh, the custodian might carve out a way to, to misuse the data. Um, this is super unfamiliar and, and kind of breeds distrust, whereas end-to-end -end encryption, at least from what we can see, is, uh, is uh, understood enough that people trust it. Um, I think that's why a lot of privacy organizations and experts like the Ele Electronic Frontier Foundation, Center for Democracy and Technology, advocate end-to-end -end encryption. And that's despite, of course, the acknowledgement that it's not perfect. Um, and in some instances, there's metadata associated with the, with the messages that can still be analyzed and, and misused. Um, but the actual contents of messages, that, that remains um, private. And we'll get more into end-to-end -end encryption um, soon. So yeah, the, this is a kind of somewhat remarkable um, trend. Uh, which is the sort of num it's the number of user accounts protected by end-to-end -end encryption globally, which has sort of steadily increased since since uh, in the last decade. So this growth is partially through uh, services that already have end-to-end -end encryption inc increasing their user numbers, like WhatsApp and uh, and Viber. So this is some evidence that the appeal of end-to-end -end encryption as a value proposition to users um, is successful. So people want to use WhatsApp despite the fact that WhatsApp can't run like a complex natural language processing on the contents of messages and use that to like improve the service. The fact that the data is end-to-end -end encrypted is 
you know, has seen uh, the service grow to 2 billion users, among other benefits, of course. Um, but this growth up to 4 billion accounts, um, you know, in 2020, again, acknowledging that there's probably overlap between different services, but still there's 4 billion accounts roughly that are end-to-end -end encrypted, um, is also due to uh, services that have been around for a while, like Skype, deciding late in the day that it's in their best interest to commercially, or best commercial interest to introduce end-to-end -end encryption. So um, in 2018, Skype decides, okay, we need to include this. Last year, Snapchat decides that they're gonna introduce end-to-end -end encryption. I think it's really important to, to, fo to focus on this point. Like when Skype and Snapchat introduce end-to-end -end encryption, they are prioritizing consumer trust and the associated in increase or expected increase in usage and adoption. They're prioritizing that over the monetization they would potentially realize from continuing to use or analyze or sell plain text user data. So I, that's like the one kind of like the main point of uh, um, this talk, which is that there's a, a fork in the road where you, you have to balance or you have to, there's a trade-off between um, the trust of your customers and how you can monetize their data. And I think the interesting thing is that these platforms that ostensibly survive based on advertising, analytics, mining, are introducing protections, whilst other corporations who are like not technology companies are sort of rushing in the opposite direction. And that's, that's a really important thing to bear in mind. Um, so I'll just last point on this slide, which is that I included Zoom here. Uh, kind of as a double joke because they uh, not only falsely advertised that they had end-to-end -end encryption, but they also falsely advertised that they had 300 million daily active users, which turned out to be not true. So you can ignore Zoom on this slide, but it's, uh, it's, it's, it's interesting that they wanted to um, portray themselves as protecting user privacy. Yeah, so Derek mentioned earlier that there's a transformation from manufacturer to tech company um, occurring, not only amongst automotive, in the automotive industry, but in, in other industries too. Um, I think it was Goldman Sachs famously said they were a technology company uh, maybe almost 10 years ago. And so while I think like this transition is possible and perhaps essential, I think it's really important to, to bear in mind um, that not all Silicon Valley firms have the same strategy with regard to the privacy of their users. And this isn't to say that Aragon is a, sorry, so it isn't to say that uh, Apple isn't, or is a paragon of, a, of virtue with regard to privacy. Apple uh, certainly profits off um, misuse of data indirectly, but they see more commercial value in maintaining the trust and loyalty of their users than these promises of big data analytics. Um, and they nurture this reputation with a lot of marketing, but they also have de genuine differentiators with regard to privacy. So easy example, Siri associates your voice with a random identifier, not you as a person, and th they don't harvest a profile on you like some of the other um, kind of Alexas and, and Google Homes do. Obviously, Apple also likes scolding other tech companies on this, which suits them from a PR point of view. But I think the point is, again, that they are, um, they've chosen a strategy of uh, having your back on privacy. And it's important not to put all of the, <laughs> all of the um, tech companies in the same, same basket in this respect. OK, so let's quickly talk about how end-to-end -end encryption relates to access control, i.e. deciding who can see your data. So we'll walk through a very typical um, flow of uh, permission update or, or sharing data. And then we'll explain, I'll explain um, the limitations um, associated with the uh, current approaches to this. So we'll start with Alice as the data controller. She wants to share data with Bob. So what needs to happen is if the data is encrypted already, it needs to be decrypted into plain text or some conduit to the data like a symmetric key needs to be decrypted. And then it's encrypted again <coughs> for Bob using his public key. Um, so, and then she can do this for Charlie and kind of anyone else she wants to share data with. 
Um, what really matters is where this process of decrypting and then encrypting for a new recipient occurs. So if it happens in the client, like on her device or in her car um, or locally, basically, then yes, this is end-to-end -end encryption because <clears throat> the um, data is encrypted locally and, sorry, just a bit of water. <clears throat> Pardon me. So yeah, so in this case where it's um, encrypted on the client, we can claim that her privacy is preserved and she's protected. Um, the problem with this is that it's rather unwieldy and unscalable. Um, it would be extremely difficult to encrypt for multiple recipients at the same time. It would not be applicable, this simple sort of public key infrastructure where it's just uh, everything is happening on her device. It would not be possible in many, many automotive uh, use cases and applications. And it's uh, also why there are limitations, for example, on like WhatsApp calls. Um, the number of people <clears throat> that you can simultaneously encrypt for on the, on the device is, uh, is limited by the computational overhead of encrypting. So what typically happens with most um, applications is that it occurs on a remote server and that allows the scalability, but it implies, because you are decrypting the data on that server, trust in the, whoever is managing that server. So as I've referred to a few times, the data custodian or um, some third party or like a key management system. So in this case, it's no longer trustless. It's, um, it kind of falls back to the hazy world of privacy policies and trust and promises and um, the hope that a PR scandal is enough of a disincentive to not harvest or misuse data. So now we're going to talk about new cipher and proxy re-encryption. And this explains how we can get both scalability and, um, and uh, privacy preservation using a cryptographic technique called proxy re-encryption. So it starts in the same way with Alice taking her private data and sending it to storage somewhere, but first encrypting it with her public key. So now it's encrypted solely for her. This generates a ciphertext, which is sort of like the way you would access the data. She wants to share this data with Bob, but she's only encrypted it for herself. So if he was to try and decrypt it at this moment with his public key, it wouldn't work, It'd just be rejected. So in proxy re-encryption, what her device does is it generates something called a re-encryption key, which is constructed from her private key and his public key, but it happens on her device. So her private key stays there. It's also very difficult to reverse engineer this to get her private key. This private key, sorry, this re-encryption key is sent to a proxy, which is this remote third party, anonymous, untrusted machine. They take the ciphertext, they take the re-encryption key, and they use it to generate a ciphertext for Bob. They do this in exchange for some payment, which is what was just shown there. This transform ciphertext is now decryptable by Bob and Bob only, so he can use his private key to decrypt it and access the data that Alice intended him to see. So this has some unique benefits. One, an array of proxies means that there's a lot of redundancy. A set of proxies can perform this service for you. You can attach conditions to the re-encryption, so only share with Bob if he pays. And the most important thing, the thing we've been banging on about from the beginning of this talk, the data stayed encrypted the whole way. It was transformed, but it stayed encrypted. New Cypher actually splits the re-encryption key into many, many parts, sends it to multiple proxies. They each re-encrypt, and then a smaller number of those ciphertexts are recombined at the end to produce the ciphertext for Bob. So this is a way to introduce more security um, and redundancy via a threshold scheme, which we won't need to go into the detail of. So that's sort of like a very quick crash course in proxy re-encryption. We'll happy to take questions on that. Um, but the basic idea is that it allows for a large set of service providers, proxies, to perform access control on demand without um, ever trusting them with the underlying contents of the data. So in that sense, it's end-to-end -end encrypted. Um, I'll very, very quickly talk about the network, um, and then I'll hand back to Derek. Um, so in New Cypher is a is a decentralized network, like many blockchain projects. And the nodes of the network are the proxies, in this case. 
And these network nodes, as I mentioned during the video, are semi-anonymous, untrusted service providers. So machines around the world that perform this service view. As we've established, they're no, they don't get anywhere near the underlying data that they're helping, uh, helping um, update permissions for. But they still need to be sort of motivated and to, to do the job. And so they're incentivized through a, a protocol that subsidizes their activities and also handles the fees that they're paid for doing this service. Um, and there's a whole bunch of failovers and um, protections against anything going wrong. So for example, um, if they re-encrypt incorrectly, it can be proven by the protocol and they can get punished. Um, the other kind of qualities that are relevant to this network, and again, we can take questions on the network because it's not a super familiar concept normally outside of the blockchain space, but the primary, uh, primary quality, again, sort of shared by many networks is that it's decentralized, so no one controls it, permissionless, anyone can be a service provider, and it's censorship, censorship resistant in the sense that you could like shut down all the proxies in one country, but there'd still be plenty of others that can handle this uh, data sharing flow. Uh, it's very scalable, which is something I mentioned as a limitation of like um, encrypting in the client. So because you have, you can spin up and spin down hundreds of proxies, reliable for multiple reasons I don't have time to get into, including things like incentive structures. It can support other cryptographic primitives, so not just data sharing, but things like signing. And it's, uh, there's a range of unique features uh, that are possible thanks to new Cypher software supported by the network, which Derek is going to touch upon right now. So I'm going to hand over to him. Thank you. So um, just to, to reiterate what uh, Arj is pointing out. So proxy encryption is, it allows for this ciphertext to ciphertext transformation to occur. And that all occurs without the data being decrypted at any point or having access to, to private keys. And so that's sort of this really strong property that allows for this end-to-end -end encryption while still facilitating some data sharing uh, capabilities. And so just to talk a little bit about the unique advantages. Um, so one of the cool things is that because access to data is purely based on whatever key that it's encrypted with. So, you, so, you know, proxy re-encryption has this one-to-many sort of paradigm where you can encrypt the data once and then selectively do this re-encryption that uh, Arj pointed out to multiple recipients. So you re-encrypt for each recipient, but, you, but in terms of data production, you produce the data encrypted one, like once and encrypted with a particular key. And so proxy encryption allows this disaggregation between the owner of the data and the thing that's actually producing the data, right? Uh, in our parlance, we call it an Enrico, but it facilitates for this like very lightweight sort of IoT device or you can, you know, specific to vehicles, it could be a sensor in the car. So you tell the sensor in the car, here's the key to encrypt your data with. So before the data even leaves the sensor, it gets encrypted. And then Alice separately can decide who can have access to the data being produced there, right? So now your device that's producing the data is sort of walled off from who it's actually sharing data with. All it cares about is producing data that's encrypted in some particular fashion, right? And if you were to use traditional PKE, you know, as Arj mentioned, you end up in this trust paradigm where you have to trust some server to manage these permissions for you while being able to decrypt the data. Um, and if you were to move away from that, where, as Arj pointed out, you can encrypt data on the client itself, this producer of data would have to know who you're sharing the data with and what their public key is to encrypt the data to send to them. And so now you have this situation where instead of having to encrypt the data multiple times and that lightweight IoT device can no longer be lightweight anymore because it has to generate, you know, 100 copies of the data encrypted for 100 different people. Now you can encrypt the data once and then selectively uh, grant access as a separate uh, process. And so um, because Alice, one interesting property is that because the, the data owner, who we call Alice, um, knows 
or specifies what key that this device or Enrico is going to use, she can do this interesting thing where she actually can grant access to data that will be produced in the future. So data may not be produced right now, but when it does get produced, she can generate a, a policy even before or an access mechanism by issuing this re-encryption key to this proxy that we call, that we call Ursula uh, before the data is produced. So one interesting use case for that could be things like, you know, if the sensor in the car for the airbag, for instance, maybe that doesn't produce data all the time, but it, put, but it produces data when an accident happens. Alice can actually, before the, the accident even happens, when she first buys the car, can specify that the airbag sensor use this particular key and she can grant access to an insurance company or, or some other entity before the data is even produced by this, this, this entity. And so that's a really kind of cool uh, use case where you don't, you know, Alice doesn't need to be online and grant access at the time the data is needed. She can actually grant access before uh, access is even needed or the data is even, even generated. And the other part is how easy revocation is. And so, you know, if, if you think about P, you know, public key cryptography, you know, a lot of times, as Arj mentioned, there's a scalability problem. And sometimes what people do to get around that scalability problem is to maybe use a group key, for instance, that each person in the group has access to the private key. Again, not the most uh, secure way of doing things, but that's what we've seen in the field. And therefore, you uh, can encrypt the data for that group key, and then everybody who's part of that group can decrypt the data. However, where you run into problems is if one person in that group has left the company for some reason, how do you then specifically revoke access to that person who already had access to this group's private key, right? And, and so basically what you end up having to do is to uh, basically scrap that group, uh, that group key and create a new one and then have the other, the remaining members who haven't left the company use this new private key for this new group key that, that, that's been issued. Um, but in proxy re-encryption, the easy thing is that because data is encrypted once and then gets re-encrypted per person based on this re-encryption key, revocation becomes significantly easier because all you have to do is tell the proxy, Ursula that we call it, uh, to delete this re-encryption key for this particular recipient. Right, so re-encryption keys are, are per recipient because each recipient has a different uh, public key that the data needs to be transformed into. But you can specifically revoke access to that person by deleting that re-encryption key. And therefore, the proxy can no longer re-encrypt data for that particular person. And so that allows for this really easy way of, rev of, of revoking data. And just to clarify, when we talk about revoking data, don't think about it as, like, like it doesn't matter what cryptographic scheme you use, revoking access to static data that somebody's already seen is not revocation because once you've seen data, you can't unsee it. So things like sharing my current address, I can't revoke access to that I've already granted to somebody seeing my current address because if they've already seen it, they can't unsee it. And so what we really mean by revocation is this concept of continuous data. Uh, obviously that applies to cars that produce continuous data over time. And what revocation does is that when revocation occurs at a particular time, any subsequent data is no longer accessible, right? So the, the person would have had access up until the time of revocation. And at the time of revocation, there's no more data that can be, uh, that can be perused, sorry, by the, uh, by the recipient. And so just to, to, to reinforce that point, we're gonna show you a little bit of a demo uh, specific to uh, vehicle data. Um, and this was actually a demo that we sort of initially did as part of a Moby hackathon, um, just something that we put together. And, but we've extended it since to sort of show how granular you, know, you can make access to data and have the user sort of control who has access to what uh, without giving access to the whole gamut of all of the data being produced by a car. So let's imagine this scenario where 
Alice is some data, is some owner of a car. What she can do is specify a key to devices on the car to say, here's the, the encryption key I want you to use when you're generating data. Uh, the car then generates this data. It can, or the devices on the car can generate this data. Um, this data can be stored anywhere. So New Cypher is storage agnostic. Um, we don't store your data or anything like that. Uh, and so then maybe Alice wants to share some of her data with some entity company. So that could be, for example, like an insurance company for if she wants to um, maybe give them some data about her car so that she can get an insurance policy quote. Um, and so Alice will then grant access to the data being generated based on the key that she provided uh, to issue that access policy with that re-encryption key to the new Cypher network. And then the entity, Bob, who wants to access the, or Alice wants to access this data, can go get the data from wherever it's stored, uh, get it re-encrypted by the new Cypher network, and then use it in whatever fashion that, um, that for the service that they're, they're providing. So we're just gonna work through that example here. Uh, so uh, this just looks like a lot of CLI stuff, but fundamentally what I'm doing is I'm running a local new Cypher network that has five nodes, right? So there are five nodes running. Uh, that's running as part of this. And so now I'm running this demo. So it's the same image. We have Alicia, who's the car owner. I'm gonna open the tab for her. Let's say we have two devices on the car, which we call uh, Enrico. And let's say we have a recipient of that data, which is an insurer. And let's say that eventually Alice wants to get her car serviced by some service center because she thinks that there's some issue with the car. So uh, there are different types of data. Obviously there could be more for demo purposes. We just generated some very simple ones. So, you know, vehicular data tends to be sort of more vehicle information is more sort of static, but perhaps you still want to encrypt, you still want to encrypt it to make sure that you know, it doesn't go into the wrong hands. And so she can specify to whatever vehicle information data generator on the car or whatever sensors on the car that, or unit on the car that provides this information, she could say, please use this encryption key when you're producing data. And so it's fairly static. It's just one data point because the car just is what it is. Um, but let's, let's, for a more sort of intriguing uh, use case, let's say there's an onboard diagnostics device on this car. Alice can specify, this is just a, an encryption key, she can specify to the onboard device on that car to use this key when generating data. So uh, I'm just showing the data in plain text here just to show you what's getting generated. So some information about temperature, speed, et cetera. Um, but fundamentally, this data is stored somewhere. For the purposes of a demo, it's stored in a database, but it is stored in this encrypted fashion. And this is sort of continuous data, so this being produced every so often. So now, obviously, if you are the insurer and you want to access Alice's vehicle information, you don't have access. So you shouldn't be able to read the data, and particularly because it's not encrypted for you. So what you, what you can do is pro provide your public keys, which Arj was mentioning, to, to, um, to Alice, who will then say, okay, I will provide um, access to you based on your keys, only to my vehicular information. So Alice can grant access, we go back to the insurer, and sure enough, now they can see the data. However, remember, we're generating both vehicle information and onboard diagnostics. If they try to access the onboard diagnostics, they've been revoked because the onboard diagnostics use a different key, and therefore it's a different level of granularity. So if they want to see that as an insurer, Alice, the data owner, again, has to specify access to uh, that data. Right, so now access has been granted. And just to clarify, you can do some interesting sort of policies around uh, re-encryption keys. So you can say things like, I only want to grant access for five days. 
because why would they need more than five days to generate a cool, for instance? And this is part of these thresholds that Arj was talking about. Obviously, for demo purposes, we're just doing one of one. So Alice is granted access to this onboard diagnostic data, which the insurer can now see and can utilize that data uh, to generate a quote to get back to Alice and just sort of observe metrics and, and, and other things. And so now while that's going on, what if Alice wanted to get her car serviced, right? So she goes to a service center, the service center is like, you know, we need access to your onboard diagnostics information, uh, which they don't have access to, right? Just because they granted access to the insurer, obviously the service center shouldn't have access. So now the service center has to provide their keys to Alice, who then has to uh, specifically grant access to uh, that uh, service center, right, which has now been granted. And so now if you're that service center, with sorry about that so if you're that service center you would basically be granted access uh, specifically uh, by Alice Bob is draining. There we go. So apologies, this is a live demo. So anyways, the, so the, the service center is able to uh, access that data subsequently, even though this service center, the original service center was still able to access this data. And not only that, there we go. Not only that, but Alice can then revoke access to that particular service center without revoking access to uh, the insurance provider. And so now you have this sort of, um, now you have this um, sort of level of granularity that ensures that the data is only accessible by the people that Alice specifically specifies. And so, um, apologies about the demo. Um, I can provide a link to the actual working demo afterwards. But, um, but yeah, uh, you know, at Newcipher, we're focused on privacy. Uh, this end-to-end -end encryption, end -end encryption is, is something we think that uh, allows for this differentiating value for manufacturers and vehicle manufacturers to provide to consumers and to give them choice um, and while preserving their privacy but still providing a, uh, a positive service. So we're happy to just take to, questions. Yeah, and just to tie everything together, I think it's, it's really remarkable um, what Derek just uh, demoed, which is that um, data could be encrypted on the vehicle itself um, and then a fine grained uh, access control uh, setup or like interface for the driver such that they can have multiple recipients revoke flexibly whenever they want. Um, you could have some data that's just by default shared, you know, something that's like low level data that isn't particularly sensitive could be shared with the OEM. But the point is, is that there's this scalable, functional um, way of, of guaranteeing this kind of privacy and end-to-end -end encryption. Um, obviously, as I, in my part of the talk, I talked about um, messaging platforms. Um, they have some limitations, the protocols they use, even though they're, they're strong proof of uh, adoption and, and uh, consumer appeal. But obviously, uh, New Cypher's raison d'etre is to be an even more powerful um, and flexible version of end-to-end -end encryption um, that is particularly apposite for um, the automotive use case.
Thank you so much. We have a little more than five minutes. Does anybody want to jump in with questions? Yeah, Jim Mason. Um, so the reverse proxy encryption uh, model that you demoed does make sense for certain use cases because it does provide, as you point out, um, a quote of point to point um, fine grained access control model that you don't get with standard messaging models, right? Between point A and point B. So you get more privacy pre preserving attributes out of this model, which is good. It's to me, it's very similar to TLS encryption and a reverse proxy server for the web, right? Where you have a middleman sitting there and has in a sense the same ability your network does to provide that access control. So the question is, does your um, software, uh, is it something that a, a company can uh, in a sense um, deploy to their own environment as opposed to using your service? So uh, just to just to talk about the the point to point sort of aspect. So uh, you know TLS is more if I'm sort of communicating with some peer directly, then sure TLS will encrypt data that's being communicated between two parties. What we're talking about here is the ability for a data custodian to store data without actually knowing what data is there, <laughs> and while still facilitating the ability for this data to be shared. Right, so now instead of having to trust that Amazon or Google servers are not looking at your data, no, no, they, they, all they see is encrypted data and they can't do anything with it other than you know, maybe provide some portal for you to be able to um, control access using new cyber. So, um, so it's, 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 don't just think about it as point to point. Yes, it could work point to point, but also it's about the ability to actually be able to store your data and then control access to it on top of that. In terms right. of how, in terms of how our, our technology could be used, so right now, I mean, our, our focus has been in the decentralized, trustless space, just because there's a strong, there's an even stronger value proposition in, this, in a situation where it's trustless, right? So people are storing data not on some designated server, but on you know random nodes on the network. Um, that being said, our technology is built in a, on an underlying proxy encryption library. Uh, and then, uh, you know, we, there is the ability to run it in what we call federated mode, where you can just run nodes yourself within your own company. Um, but our focus thus far has been more on the decentralized aspect, particularly with blockchain, because of this trustless paradigm that we want to ensure that we're able to, to provide. So the, all right, so my original question was just simply, can I run this on my own network period um, using the same model? Can I set up my own reverse proxy uh, encryption service, if you will, um, and do this internally in my corporation without using your outside service to do this? The short answer is yes, everything is open yeah. source. It's perfectly possible to set up your own okay. network. All right. that's, awesome. that's more of a, that's yeah. more of a licensing issue than a, yeah, a service issue. Oh, that's great. So then, yeah, it would, it, I think it, it, the way you just explained it shows that I have two different models. I can, in a sense, use this reverse proxy encryption um, capability, if you will, either on my own network or using your hosted service. Yeah, and just to underline what Derek said, I mean, the, in terms of the distinction with TLS, um, we didn't, we kind of glazed over this point, but like the fact that you could have encrypted data sitting in some S3 bucket or something even more trustless like decentralized storage, and then just on the fly update permissions associated with that data is much more powerful than, um, for example, uh, the, uh, some of the messaging protocols where it, it's basically just stored on the devices. So it, yeah, so there's some limitations there, even though they are also into yeah, encryption. No, I wasn't trying to point that TLS was anything close to what this is. The point is TLS is a service that I can set up on my own servers, uh, period. Um, and in a sense, make it transparent uh, to the end-to-end -end process, if you will. That's all. Well, I wasn't right. trying to compare the two. Um, right. So there's lots of strategies for making data private, for sure, sharding it, all kinds of stuff. Thanks. Mm -hmm. So I, I know we're running out of time. Uh, one, one quick thing for me. So, so thank you for this. I think this is very useful. Um, so thanks, guys. Great presentation. Um, I think we, we share Moby and Moby. We do share um, your philosophy of privacy preserving uh, privacy by design, right? So this is something that's super critical going forward. And a lot of it will be dictated by GDPR and CCPA. 
but the one thing here is, I mean, everyone wants encryption, everyone wants security, uh, but the cost, right? The cost is monetary, one, and two, performance. So I think it would be great if you guys publish some uh, normalized data on your performance and publish some uh, cost per uh, X transaction, something, right? Something that, that I think we can share with the OEMs and, and other big players so that the way they know at the end of the day, uh, what it's gonna cost them. And those are, are the two biggest metrics that, that I see uh, that moves the needles for them. That's a really good point. And my reaction would be that if it's the cost and performance, then I think that's good news for us because the cost of access control is, is minuscule, like at scale, right? You can compare it to um, established centralized equivalents like Amazon KMS and it's, uh, it, is a, it isn't a budget breaker. Um, in terms of you know the per re-encryption sure. per decryption thing, and then yeah. on the performance side, I think it's I, I want to just make a quick point, which is that um, this is about selective sharing as opposed to keeping something encrypted and completely um, useless forever. So it's more about the 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 sovereignty of the data. And to, I know we're over time, but like to give an example, if the, this is a way to guarantee to vehicle owners that they are the ones who are consenting to, uh, to, to data being used, as opposed to, as I mentioned, like legal um, structures and the, the possibility of repercussions for misuse. So like you could go to your dealership, you could share a bunch of diagnostic data, um, actively, proactively share it in exchange for, let's say, a discount on some upgrade. And then all that data is in plain text. It's, you know, it's, it's with the OEM, they can do whatever they want, the performance is the same. This is really, in a way, like more, more simple than, um, you know, we're not proposing here, uh, uh, like deep learning on encrypted data, even though that is something we research. Here in this proposal, we're mainly just talking about uh, it's encrypted until the OEM becomes the designated recipient. That's no, no, kind of the point. It, no, I understand, but at the vehicle, yeah. uh, you're, you're, you're adding a process here. You, you want encryption end-to-end, uh, -end. so at the vehicle, you need some computational resources, you need some uh, additional uh, processing of the data, right? Uh, so that adds something. So what they want to understand, if I'm an OEM, I want to understand what that looks like uh, and what is going to, uh, how will a million transactions uh, or, mm -hmm. or processes uh, look like normalized to uh, something that doesn't have this type of processing uh, in place. Uh, where it's done at a central server, for example, like you said. That's totally fair. And I think, um, so you're giving me an opportunity to, to plug something else that's important. So uh, apologies for that. But uh, the point here compared to like, it's comparable to a central server because let's say, for example, you're, a, you're doing vehicle to vehicle, vehicle to vehicle communication whilst on the road. And let's say there's like 100 cars that you need to share some data with, right? Kind of weird example. But um, if you were to do it the the sort of basic way then it would be as i uh, described like encrypting for each of these cars right the, with the new cipher network or with um, proxy re-encryption the idea is is that you're encrypting some some packet of information once and then it can be re-encrypted for different uh, recipients by the network so the network has that capacity that flexible capacity kind of like a server except that they're not except that they're not able to or they're not required even to decrypt it in order to update that permission. So yes, it is trying to mimic that performance. The network is like, is, is like a centralized KMS service that, that uses um, the power of, of um, uh, cloud computing, um, but without the trust issues. So, so that, that's a, it's a really important point about performance. And, but I will also follow up with what you said and, and we'll try and publish some, some metrics on the two yep. things you mentioned. Thanks guys. Thank you, Derek, and thank you, Arjun, for your time today and speaking to our audience. You provided us with a lot of facts and information. I personally had no idea that Americans on average spend 18 days out of the year in their car. Did I hear that correctly? 18 days? I think that's just a commute. Well, so it might, yeah. might be more than that. Yeah, exactly. Real commutes are a lot longer than 18 days. <laughs> wow. As you. mentioned, uh, the recording will be posted up on our website in the coming weeks. And our next community lecture is Wednesday, July 15th. Until then, take care, everyone, and have a great day. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.